Hello and welcome to another edition of For the Record. I'm Sean Murphy. My guest today is Paul Gianfrido, President and CEO of Mental Health America, former mayor of Middletown also. And th this month is Mental Health Awareness Month, correct? That's right. Since right. 1949, May is Mental Health Month. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Uh, you've written a book. Um, your son has schizophrenia, right? Yes, he does. Uh, and homeless right now? He is. And uh, p part of that story, which we'll talk about, is in your book. The book is called Losing Tim. And mainly you're here to talk about mental health, so I'll allow you to kind of start wherever you would like, and then we'll just kind of take it from there. Sure. Uh, Tim is 30 years old right now, and he's been homeless for the better part of the last 10 years. And he is caught in the revolving door that exists today for a lot of people with serious mental illness. That's a revolving door between homelessness, hospitalization on occasion, and frequent incarceration. And we created this system as a matter of public policy because we set a different standard for mental illnesses than any other chronic conditions or diseases in America. We said in order to get services, you have to be a danger to yourself or others. And that's not a clinical standard. And what that's done is taken a lot of mental health care and moved it from state psychiatric hospitals in the 1980s into jails and prisons today. It's moved a lot of triage from emergency medical technicians uh, to police officers and it's moved a lot of the emergency care from hospitals to jails. And a lot of those places that you say move to, those people might not necessarily be qualified or certainly can't diagnose somebody with. Uh, what I've discovered in doing so many shows is that mental illness is such a broad umbrella and there are so many things that can fall under it. There's a lot of different diseases. Yeah. Uh, schizophrenia, which Tim has and has had since he was five years old, is very different from major depressive disorder, which is very different from bipolar disorder. So it's a lot of different diseases, just like cancers are a lot of different diseases. When I, um, uh, whenever somebody is involved the way that you are with mental health, uh, it inevitably is always because something has happened close to you in your life. Obviously, in this case, it's your son. But was that the impetus for you to get involved to the point where you are now? Well, what makes me unique is there were two things that were dumped on me. And, and as I say, thrown into the middle of the pool. The second one was Tim, who developed those signs and symptoms of schizophrenia when he was five. And we had no idea what to do about that. The first time, though, was about 10 years before that, when I first entered the Connecticut State Legislature and was assigned to do health because nobody else wanted to. I had no background in health or mental health. I had very little interest in doing mental health policy at that time. Wow. Nobody else had Were any interest. Were you like interest. the low guy on the totem pole? I was the low guy on the totem pole. I was exactly what happened. I was the low guy on the totem pole. They called me into the uh, chairs of the Appropriations Committee, which I was on. They said, what committees do you want to serve on? I gave them three answers. None of them were this. None of them were this. They wow. said, you're going to do this. I wow. said, I don't want to. They said, neither does anybody else. Oh, you're going to do goodness. this. Now, what is your background? Well, I was a, an undergraduate philosophy major at Wesleyan University. Wow. And, uh, and that was pretty much it. I, I was elected to the state legislature when I was 25 years old and stayed That's for young. 11 years. That was pretty young. Yeah. And, uh, and so I, I, I learned mental health policy on the job, and then I learned uh, mental health issues in the family pretty much on that job as a parent, too. Yeah, do you, do you see any, any irony or, or karma, if you will, in the fact that you got involved in something that you really didn't want to do, they kind of forced you into it, and then um, something happened in your life personally that caused you to sort of already be trained a little bit or have some knowledge about it. What are the odds? Yeah, I know, what are the odds? But today, it's that combination that has made our story, Tim's story and my story, that I capture in the book, Losing Tim, somewhat unique. Uh, there are other parents who've written stories about kids with serious mental illnesses. None of them have been policy makers who were involved in developing the policies that really impacted the lives of those children. You know, you, you kind of answered this before, but I'll ask it again because, again, mental health, there's such a broad stroke uh, th that people use as a brush when they describe it, and there certainly are a lot of misconceptions about it, aren't there? There are a lot of misconceptions. A lot of people think that these are just bad behaviors, and they think that people can just, if they're depressed, just snap themselves out of it. Or they blame parents uh, if kids are, are acting out in school because they're showing signs and symptoms of mental illness. But 50% of mental illnesses manifest by the age of 14. And so this is, these are diseases of childhood for the most part. And nobody says to a parent whose kid gets cancer, oh, you're being overprotective. Nobody says 
to a parent who's, whose kid's got intellectual disabilities. They don't belong in the classroom. Nobody says to a parent whose kid's got uh, developmental or, or uh, physical disabilities that they can't be uh, educated in the mainstream in schools. But all day, every day, people are being told you can't have those kids in the classroom who have got mental illnesses. Is it because society in general just to, still, even to this day, doesn't understand mental illness as well as, you know, they know cancer? Yeah, there's a lot of stigma. There was a lot of stigma around cancer uh, yeah. a couple of generations ago, but thankfully much of that, not all of it's gone away, but we're still where cancer was 50 and 60 years ago. AIDS, you know? We, yeah, AIDS, a lot of that's gone away, but we're where HIV was 30 years ago. Yeah. And it's a real shame because half of the people uh, will have some diagnosable mental illness during the course of our lifetimes. And in any given year, about a quarter of us will have a diagnosable mental illness. And so these are common diseases as well. And if left untreated, can frequently move from stage one to stage two to stage three to stage four, where people have that crisis event. And just like any other chronic disease or chronic condition, and that's why we need to intervene earlier, and that's one of the things we're advocating for. Is the key to proper diagnosis the identifying of it and understanding it? We, you, I would imagine that you know, you know, being plugged in as well as you are, uh, progress is being made. Progress is being made. The, the science is catching up with some of our advocacy. Right now, the uh, National Institutes for Mental Health have been developing, at least for psychosis, a staging uh, science so that people will understand that the stages work pretty much the way the stages work for cancer. Uh, and, and that will explain the importance of interacting and, and addressing mental illnesses before stage four. Uh, but in addition to that, I think it's critically important that people do understand uh, more about this. People put some of these issues out in the open. Uh, that we start looking at the early warning signs of mental illnesses like we look at the early warning signs of cancer. What are they? Well, in Tim's case, when he was five years old, the first signs of, of mental illness that he showed were difficulty in forming friendships uh, in kindergarten. Uh, he would sometimes withdraw and go off by himself in a surprising way. He was an extraordinary risk taker. When he was six years old, he went out and laid down in the middle of the street just to see if a car would run him over. Uh, he had difficulty uh, with his siblings, and, and his siblings have difficulty with him. And he was very um, hard, basically. It was very difficult for him to pay attention in school. He was easily distractible, and it was hard for him uh, to do a lot of the fine motor stuff in school. And if you put all these things together, uh, a lot of people say, oh, that sounds like ADD, ADHD. Yeah. And that's another thing where people kind of, doctors or people in general, will kind of drop the label on, sometimes almost when they can't really understand or explain it, they drop the ADD label on, well, it must be that. Yeah, a lot of our kids start with an ADHD they label. They start with Ritalin. And then, you know? and then you start with Ritalin, and you don't have the right response to Ritalin, uh, which is a very good drug, but not for kids who don't have ADHD. Yeah. And if they've got psychosis, uh, if they've got schizophrenia, they need other medications, they need other kinds of therapies. And unfortunately, what frequently happens is um, about 10 years pass in this country from the time that people first show signs of mental illness to the time they get their accurate and final diagnosis and treatment. And those are 10 lost years. And with kids, yeah. those are 10 years that are really lost. Can you explain in sort of layman's terms what schizophrenia is so people can understand it? Well, I think that's the one where the, the easiest thing for people to think about um, is hearing voices, either auditory hallucinations, visual hallucinations. Um, and that's that's kind of the thing that people most associate with schizophrenia. You see some of that with bipolar disorder too, but um, that's classic for schizophrenia. So your work in public office, was that, uh, was it a natural progression for you to kind of segue into the roles that you have now, for example, president and CEO of Mental Health America? And, and let's talk about what that is actually. Mental Health America is the nation's oldest mental health advocacy organization. We're more than a century old. Uh, we were formed by a, a man, Clifford Beers, who had been institutionalized in New Haven, Connecticut, who uh, came out of that institution and said, I'm going to fight out in the open. The very first things he did was start a movement that set up child guidance centers in the United States. And so it's been a natural uh, growth for Mental Health America, which was formerly known as the National Mental Health Association and has affiliates in, uh, all over the country, 200 or more in Connecticut, Rhode Island, and other uh, states as well to really carry the mantle of Clifford Beers to work on behalf of those people uh, whose voices are frequently not heard. And you're also uh, on the uh, Connecticut's Board of Public Health, too? Um, I'm on the 
um, SAMHSA, Center for Mental Health Services, National Advisory Council. It's a 12-member group at the federal level. Gotcha. Um, uh, May is also uh, Mental Health Awareness Month, too. Talk about that, because obviously you're, you're also here for advocacy to kind of spread the word. Do you think, uh, like, you see a lot of the diseases, like pink for breast cancer awareness. Do you think mental health is getting enough of the of push as far as public knowledge goes? Well, I think we're getting there. Um, this year, uh, for Mental Health Month, we've built our campaign around Before Stage 4, the concept of Before Stage 4, um, acting earlier with early identification and intervention, and have encouraged everybody through this month to get a mental health screening, to look for the early warning signs of mental health conditions. This year, we anticipate uh, we will have more than 6,000 organizations download our materials and many, many thousands more uh, actually produce their own materials and do their own um, work around Mental Health Month, though it is a Mental Health America initiative. And we expect that our 6,000 organizations that work with us will alone reach 10 million or more people uh, with Mental Health Month materials. And a lot of those materials this year are targeted, younger, are targeted at younger demographics, particularly younger women uh, who, who consistently are, are showing much greater concerns for their own mental health and well-being and a much greater willingness to talk about mental health issues. I think largely because um, certain celebrities like Demi Lovato and others uh, who appeal to a younger female demographic have been very open and honest about their struggles with mental health. Uh, speaking of the younger demo, um, one way to get the word out to them and to people in general is to be a part of social media, which I know that your organization is. And you got a pretty, uh, pretty decent following as far as uh, likes or friends, right? Yeah, we have 160,000 followers on Facebook and Twitter right now nice. from Mental Health America. It's very nice. And we have online screening tools. And uh, we get about 2,000 people a day coming online to mhascreening.org. Uh, to take a screen. Three quarters of those are female. More than half are under the age of 30. And, uh, and those 2,000 people are, are forming a real, I think, constituency that are concerned at the earliest stages about making certain that they maintain their health and well-being. Also, you have the ability to be anonymous if you prefer when you go online, if you wanted to ask questions but you're not maybe comfortable with people knowing. Uh, and if you can be anonymous, I guess um, it might be easier for you to because the key is to reach out so that you can be helped if you think there is a problem. That's right, and so we allow that screening to be anonymous. We take some demographic information, not names from people or addresses afterwards. And, and as I say, people have been very responsive. In the first year, we've just been doing it for a year, uh, we had more than 350,000 people complete screens. And again, now we're up to about 2,000 per day. So uh, we'll break through a half million this year who will take screens. And we think that's very important because when you get a result, right. um, it encourages you to talk to somebody about that result. And then it becomes a sort of a de facto support group, too. Exactly. In fact, we have an online support group that people can use uh, through Mental Health America nationally. Or they can contact any one of our local affiliates, the ones closest to them, and ask them what kinds of support groups exist in, in their area, in their home state, in their, their region, in their county. Well, let's do that. Let's, uh, if you want to give out a website or the easiest way to, for people to go and learn more or ask questions or do some of these things that you suggest, reach out in some way, what can they do? Where can they go? Easiest place would be to go to uh, mhascreening.org. So people can go to mentalhealthamerica.net and find us, three million people do every single year, but mhascreening.org is a great way to get started. All right, Paul G. Uh, G. and Frito, got it right. President and CEO of Mental Health America, also has a book out called Losing Tim. We'll take a short break and come back. I'm Sean Murphy, this is For the Record, stay with us. Welcome back to For the Record. I'm Sean Murphy. My guest today is Paul Gianfrido, President and CEO of Mental Health America. He also has a, a book out called Losing Tim. Uh, his son has schizophrenia and uh, is homeless from time to time. Um, what was it like writing a book? How did, uh, how did that come about? You, obviously, you wanted to share your story with the world, but just deciding one day to write the book is one thing, but then how, what's the process like? 
Well, it, it was interesting because I, I initially wrote the book for me. I wanted to make sense of what had happened to Tim over more than two decades of his life. And for some reason, I had saved everything. I had saved every email I'd written about him. I'd saved every report that we'd gotten from doctors. I'd saved all the individualized education programs that he'd had in various schools. And I just kept track of everything. And it followed me from Connecticut when I was started in Connecticut to when I moved to Texas to when I moved to Florida. And I finally decided I just wanted to pull it out and try to uh, make some sense of it and kind of see if I could understand what happened. So I embarked on a process over a three or four year period really of writing that book. And about the time I finished the first draft, I was contacted by Health Affairs. I'd had some relationship with them and they asked me if I wanted to write a piece that they call Narrative Matters for the journal. And it's about a 3,000 word essay. And I said, sure, I'm, would, they, would I write it about this? And I said, well, as a matter of fact, I, I've got a draft of a book already, so I, I can shorten that to 3,000 words for you. And, and that really um, allowed this story to capture a lot of attention. The Washington Post picked it up, uh, ran it as an op-ed at about 2,500 word length in the newspaper three weeks before the presidential election in 2012. And it trended as the top read and then one of the four top read stories of that week which I thought was pretty good considering we were three weeks out from presidential election because this is an important issue. Yeah. And so many people are touched by mental illnesses. So many people have mental illness in their families. So many people are struggling to try to deal with uh, mental illness themselves. And I think this just um, it captured people's attention, not just because I was a parent, but also because I'd been a policymaker. And I could reflect on the policy decisions that we made policy decisions and mistakes that are being compounded today. Were you like super, did you learn a lot and were you kind of super surprised or taken back with that once you're, the, you were, as, as a committee, you were, you were assigned this, really not having much interest in it, but then learning so much, were the things that you were taken aback by as you were going through the process? Well, the thing that, that surprised me uh, once I was a parent, which was after I then was out of office, was that when we were deinstitutionalizing in the 1980s, we understood who was coming out of those institutions. There were people who looked like you and me, yeah. but we didn't understand what that was the going people on who, were going, who were going into those ah. institutions were kids. Yeah. And so uh, w we didn't create a system of community-based services within the schools in particular that would address the needs of kids who had serious mental illnesses, even though, as I mentioned before, 50% of them begin by the age of 14. So. We have to start in the schools yeah. and, and change the way we work with our kids in the schools. And that's a real challenge, and it's one we haven't quite mastered in the educational system as of yet. Uh, you mentioned the presidential elections, and that's a good segue into the uh, Affordable Care Act, because when people watching hear about any kind of um, medical uh, needs that are required, they always wonder whether their insurance will pay for it, whatever it is. Um, and when you're talking about mental health, it's an area where it's, so, it's supposed to be covered, but sometimes the insurance companies are a little slow on that. Talk about that a little bit. Yeah, well, uh, surprisingly, we've had uh, an interesting support from the last two presidents in this area. One of the last pieces of legislation uh, that George Bush signed in 2008 was the Mental Health Parity Act. And, of course, one of the major pieces of the first term of the Obama administration was the Affordable Care Act. Now, no matter what people think about those in general, the combination of those two laws have the potential finally uh, to equalize, if you will, the, the payment for mental health services and bring a whole lot more resources that people need uh, regarding their own mental health. The problem we have is that it's one thing to pass a law, but then it's another thing to get through the regulations and to start putting the final regulations into effect. It took nearly six years for the regulations to be written to implement the Mental Health Parity Act. And all of the regulations around the Affordable Care Act are not really in place around parity yet. So it's a little bit of a slow struggle, I have to say, that um, although the laws have changed, the practices have not completely changed, but there's now a basis for advocacy and there's opportunities uh, for people who have serious concerns about mental health not being covered fairly and equitably with physical health conditions well, there's something now that, that 
we can advocate for and something that will will be changing over the course of the next few years. It's just going to take some work to get us there. Are the insurance companies slow on this because, again, mental health is a, a sort of a tough thing to describe because it can it's so in, all encompassing. Is that the reason? Well, I think it. I think that's part of the reason, and I, I think that that if we think about again the fact that so many people think about mental health as being equivalent to danger to self or others or mental illness as being equivalent to danger to self or others, that they don't know what to do in all of that space before somebody is a danger to themselves or others or when they're not a danger to themselves or others. And most people with serious mental illnesses never have a violent thought in their lives. That's not the way it manifests. Just because you're hearing voices doesn't mean the voices are telling you to do, any, do anything that's harmful. And so we've got a lot of those misconceptions. And I think all, since all of us have them, they're in insurance, they're in policy, and, and we've got to have people think about this differently. We've just got to have them think about these things as diseases. As soon as, assuming they are diagnosed correctly, whatever the mental illness is, um, how are drugs today working on that? Uh, um, are things going well? I mean, can you, are there drugs that actually work? There have always been drugs that work. A lot of the time, though, the drugs work for some, don't work for others. There are a lot of drugs in development. And I, I often, again, encourage people to think about this the way we think about cancer and cancer therapies. Uh, the drugs for cancer um, don't work with everybody. Right. And so oftentimes, if you fail on one, you try with another one. And we try to make the best available and the newest ones available to everybody and, and make them available through insurance as well. With mental illnesses, uh, it's usually the other way around. It's, it's often in the, the state formularies in the Medicaid program. Uh, we pay for only the cheapest drugs. Yeah. We pay for only the oldest the generic, drugs. Yeah. We pay, and, and the ones that may not work for everybody, they still work for some people, but they don't work for everybody. And what we need to be able to do is, is open up the entire arsenal that we've got all the tools in the toolkit uh, to address mental illness, just the way we do it with cancer. And if we did that, it would make a big difference. Are doctors finding it easier to identify mental illness, even, uh, even specific mental illnesses, uh, more easily these days? Well, I, I think it's still an uphill climb there, too, in some respects, because a lot of doctors will tell you that they were never trained to recognize and deal with mental illness. And, and most doctors who are treating mental illnesses are primary care clinicians. Yeah. They're not specialists. For them, it's on-the-job training, too, just like it was for you, right? Exactly, exactly. That's why we like to encourage them, too, to use the screenings. And, because, and, and that's why we like to encourage people to, to go to our website, you know, get the screening done before you go see your doctor. Do it on your smartphone when you've got nothing else to do when you're sitting in the waiting room waiting to go see the doctor, and then just bring the results into the office and start the conversation. Uh, because sometimes the doctors need that too, and it'll help the doctors uh, direct themselves uh, correctly and, and, and dealing with the right condition, whether it's bipolar or depression, anxiety, psychosis, or something else. Since May is Mental Health Awareness Month, if you, if you could condense it down uh, to uh, what you'd want to tell people about it as an advocate, what would you say? It would be this, that we need to be thinking about uh, mental illnesses before stage four. And we need to go onto our website and screen. We need to do ubiquitous screening. Every child uh, should be, uh, have access to mental health screening, same as they have access to vision screening, hearing screening, oral health screening. Every adult should have access to mental health screening. And it should be as common as blood pressure screening for us. Uh, that's all this is. And that's what we need to do. And that's what preserving and protecting mental health is about versus just focusing in on the latest stages of mental illness. Not everybody's gonna to get to the latest stages of mental illness, nor should a lot of the people who do get there, get there at all. If we'd be willing to look at early detection, willing to look at early intervention, we can make a difference and change trajectories of lives, and that's the message of Mental Health Month. Paul Gianfrino, President and CEO of Mental Health America, will take one more break and come right back. I'm Sean Murphy, this is For the Record. So that is our show for today. Paul, you know, I want to give out a website one more time for people to go and learn more about mental uh, health in general. Two, cho two choices, okay. mhascreening.org or mentalhealthamerica.net, either one. Uh, and how can people get a copy of Losing Tim? They can get Losing Tim through Amazon. They can get it through Mental Health America. They can get it through their local bookstore. It's a good story. Uh, sadly, it's a story that many, many people could tell. Uh, hopefully uh, people can learn uh, from this and get help, too, if they need it. Thank you for sharing your story. We appreciate it. Thank you very much. Paul Gianfrido, President and CEO of Mental Health America. May, of course, is Mental Health Awareness Month. That is our show for today. You can see this show and many others on our YouTube site, 
Till next time, I'm Sean Murphy. This is For the Record. Take care.